tell you what, I'm about hoarse from shouting to praise and worship this morning. Oh, I just love it when God's presence comes in like that. Last week, we, we dealt with a, a very powerful revelation in Romans chapter 8 that there were two laws. And uh, this week, I'm going to pull a George Lucas. I'm going to do a prequel. I'm actually going to go back earlier into the book of Romans. And we need, to, we need to take apart some things. And I'm probably going to go all the way back to the last part of chapter 5. I really had a problem with this because uh, Romans is a very unique epistle. Now, and, and all the other, most of, of the other epistles by the Apostle Paul, he was dealing with a pretty simplistic problem, whether it was sin in the church or, or the, the, the question of circumcision. Uh, Romans is the most detailed because it's not just dealing with the problem, it's he's developing a theological argument. Uh, on one hand, uh, we, we need to understand that there was Rome, how I many know Rome was basically the capital of the world? And so there was, there was a great diversity that he was writing from. On one hand, guys, he had rabbis that did not understand the gospel and may have even rejected Jesus that were reading his epistle. They were trying to figure out what on earth is going on in the synagogue. Okay. Then you had rabbis that understood the gospel and what Messiah was doing, but were upset at the Gentiles for not being Jewish enough. You had that going on in the book of Romans. Then you had the average Jewish believer that was trying to make sense of all the debate and, and what God was doing with the Jews and the Gentiles. They're, they're sitting there saying, you know, this is wonderful, I feel the presence of God, but there's all this debate and there's all this argument going on. Then on the other side, you had the average Gentile. I just showed up and found Jesus, and I'm just now finding out who Moses was. I didn't even know who Elijah was or any of these other ones. And I'm just trying to come to grips with who I am now in this new community of faith. And guys, it's all foreign to me. Wouldn't it be? And then you have the well-educated, disciplined Roman that was proud of the Roman heritage, and they had been told their whole life that they were superior to all other races on the earth. And you see that begin to manifest in the, 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 what later on came out of Rome, replacement theology. Paul had to deal with it. He said, now don't get so haughty. God nips some of them off, stick you in. He can nip you off too, Jack. You know, don't get more haughty. And so he had this wide diversity that he was trying to, you know, it's bad enough writing to the Baptist, okay, and trying to get something done. But could you imagine anywhere from Catholic to Assemblies of God, all in one congregation, and you're going to write on something that you have got to weave this tapestry of theological debate to bring them all in and to get them on the same page? That would be a nightmare. So the Apostle Paul started, I really had a hard time getting this because I almost have to preach and start in Romans 1, 1 and go all the way to the end to get the, the, the full debate because the problem is we are stepping in the middle of a tapestry that was weaved by the Apostle Paul theologically and if you pull out one string out of that tapestry, do you really understand the argument? Let me, let me give you an example. This one, everybody knows, it's in Romans 8, chapter 11, or verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. And I remember in church singing, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, woo-hoo, you know, and you, you get all excited because we thought it was talking about healing. It has nothing to do with healing. Absolutely Nothing. You're going to discover what the Apostle Paul was talking about by the end of this conversation this morning. Because when you put things back into context, you really get what God meant in that situation. How many know that's very important? Yes, now the Holy Spirit can quicken my body. How many know it is the anointing of the Holy Ghost that comes on you that brings healing anointing that can heal your flesh? But that is not what the Apostle Paul had in mind when he was writing this. And so I'm going to try to step in the midst of this argument and, not, and, and try to enter into it. Now, I, I need to set the tapestry here. Okay, now I set that about who he was debating, but who was the Apostle Paul? He was a multi-generational rabbi, a Pharisee, who from the time that he could understand speech was taught the commandments of God. This same Paul, after he wrote the book of Romans, 
there was controversy in Jerusalem that he was teaching that the law had been done away with. Now, wouldn't that be an interesting for us to be able to address that today? We did in the book of Acts, if you'd read it. Paul said, not so. And even to prove the point, he took a Nazarite vow. And I believe it was, was, I believe it was Mark that was, that was half Jewish, and so he was, allowed him to be circumcised. Another one, he wouldn't. And so he even, and Mark did it with him. And he paid for the whole process, which was a very expensive process, to prove that he was still Torah observant. And so you, you have all of that going on, and you cannot pull the book of Romans outside of that. It has to be placed back into the context of a Torah observant rabbi teaching Gentiles the mysteries of the gospel as well as having to correct his colleagues, scholars, in, in, within the, the, many of them were probably the school of Hillel or the school of Shammai, and I think he actually, because some of the terminology he uses, he addresses both as well as the highly educated Roman. I would, I'm glad the Apostle Paul did it. So let's find a place that we can kind of jump into the midst of this argument. I want to start with Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. For if by one man's death, uh, uh, for one man's offense, death reigned by one much more which they receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Christ Jesus. So we know we, we dealt with here a couple of weeks ago how that when Adam fell, sin began to reign. And it pretty much reigned unhindered, really, until Jesus. It got kind of pushed back out of the, out of the, the house of Israel when Israel was walking with God, but it never really was rectified. It, there were stopgap measures each year of the, of the atonement sacrifice and all the different sacrifices were, were stopgap measures looking for the time that God's lamb would come that was promised to Abraham. And he said, okay, he did that. Therefore, by, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto the justi justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one many were also made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. By where sin abound, grace did much more. How many like grace outdoing sin? But he was showing a part of the, the, of the, one of the purposes of the Torah was to show what sin is. Man didn't have a clue. Man was just being natural because he received a new nature in the garden. And God had to point out, this is sin. But one of the things we need to realize is that grace was not new, was not a new concept for the rabbis. God gave his Torah, he delivered them out of Egypt and gave them his Torah because of grace, didn't he? Now that may be news to a lot of New Testament believers, but there are, there are two words translated grace, both in the Greek and the Hebrew. One means like God's unmerited favor. The other means to be pretty and to be graceful. And sometimes you've got to separate those two out when you read. What's interesting is the Hebrew word translated unfair to, un, unmerited favor and then the Greek word, that that word is used three to four times as many times in the Old Testament as it was in the New Testament. You find grace all over the Old Testament. And so he, he was saying, listen, this grace has, 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 was personified in Messiah. It was released to a new measure in Messiah. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness by the eternal life of Christ Jesus our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Saints, what do you say? God forbid. We have elements of the church saying that you've got to sin every day. Or that the concept of sin has been done away with. It can't be done away with. Not until we're in a new heaven and new earth that has never been touched by sin. So do I want to continue sinning that grace much, much more abound? No, no, no. Once I have entered into that new righteousness, I stop sinning and I start walking in righteousness. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you're dead to it, why quit walking? You know, why, why walk in it? 
And let me tell you something, if you have a desire to walk in it, you're not dead to it. Because one of the things we're going to see here, he's talking about death and dying, and he's always either referring to Christ or us in, in this whole thing. I am crucified with Christ. I am dead to sin so that I might be alive to something. Now, let's see, I want to go on down to verses 13 and through 16. I'm going to jump just a little ahead in this argument. Because now he's talking, okay, you're dead to one and you're alive to other. Whatever you're alive to, you lend your members to. You lend your body to. Okay. Neither yield to your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but grace. Now that can be kind of confusing. And one of the things, a part of, of, of rabbinical argument is they will, they will either have, they can have contrasting statements to bring out something. We see this a lot in the Psalms, a, a lot even in, in the, the prophetic writings. We see it in, in Proverbs. They'll bring out two opposite things to bring out a truth. Or sometimes what they do is they, they hit you with something that so rattles you that you back up and start asking questions. What do you mean I'm dead to the law? What do you mean that I'm dead to the law? Now, what I like is that's a small L. Because he, he gets us thinking law, but what kind of law? What, what, what's going on here? What do you mean I'm dead to the law? The law is what led me to Messiah. Didn't the Apostle Paul said that, that, that the law is the pedagogy or the tutor that leads us to Messiah? So the very thing that led me to Messiah, I'm now dead to? They're, they're, he, he's causing them to go, what? To open them up to a greater truth. He's getting ready to, to reveal something, and, and he's saying, is, is, is Paul, can you, can you imagine all those rabbis? Is Paul questioning the law? Because actually, guys, if he fully questioned the law to set it aside by what the law had already written, what Moses already gave, that made the apostle Paul a false teacher. If Jesus came to set aside the law, that made him a false a messiah. Because Moses already said, if a, if a prophet comes to you and everything he says comes to pass, he does miracles, he predicts the lottery numbers tomorrow, he does all these different things. But if he leads you away from the ways of God, he's a false prophet and I was testing you. And so I can see all these rabbis saying, dude, is Paul trying to test us? What's going on here? What? To them, law and grace was synonymous. It was synonymous in their hearts and in their minds. And so he's going, what are you doing here? He goes on to say, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield uh, yourselves servants to, his servants are you to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And so here he comes again that, listen, there, there's a transition here because of God's grace that he's doing something that my members can be, my very body can become an instrument of righteousness of God in the earth. And then he goes on to make two really interesting statements. In verse 18 he says, being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Now what's interesting is righteousness is defined by the Torah. Not is only sin defined by the Torah, but so is righteousness. Both are defined. And he said, now you're dead to sin because you've been made alive unto righteousness. Then he turns around and he flips it on them in verse 20. For ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Can you see the contrasting here? Before God came into your life, you couldn't do righteousness if you wanted to. All you could do was sin because really when you, you get in Messiah and you begin living by what he's done in you, you naturally do not sin. It comes as natural to you with Messiah working in you as the old sin used to work in you. There, nobody has to go and teach anybody how to sin. There are no classes on sinning. There are no churches. Well, maybe there's churches on sinning, but there, there, there are no proper churches on sinning. 
Yeah, it just comes natural because it flows out of your heart, doesn't it? But now that I, he says, now in Messiah, I'm supposed to have died to that. So I'm no longer doing what the Torah says is sin. But out of a heart that's right with God, I naturally begin to do what it says is righteousness. Because a part of what we get, the Brit Hadashah, or the New Covenant, that, that title comes out of Jeremiah 33. And part of that promise of that New Covenant was God said, I would write my Torah on your hearts. And so he, he's kind of comforting the rabbis just a little bit. But at the same time, he's caught, they're, they're still stuck on this thing. What do you mean I'm not under the law? I was taught to treasure it my whole life. Th these are questions we need to ask. And then right in the middle of it, starting in verse 7, he starts talking about marriage. Isn't that a funny place for that? Really, isn't that a crazy place for that? But he gives us a key in verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Unless you know Torah, you're going to miss the whole point the Apostle Paul's making here. Unless you understood what I have already explained to you in the Genesis story, you are not going to have any idea of what he's talking about. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if, he, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she marrieth to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that, the, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also became dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now what's he really talking about? Were we married to the Torah? Were the Jews married to the Torah? This is... What, what's he trying to convey here? The Jewish people were never married to the Torah. They were married to God. The Torah contained the ketubah, or the marriage contract. So what is he talking about here? That there, there is a law that goes all the way back to the garden, that when Adam rejected communion with God and chose to commune with Lucifer, in a sense, man was married to Lucifer. Because marriage is the most intimate of all communions possible on planet earth. And if all knowledge comes out of communion, when I got born again, I had to die to Lucifer. I didn't die to God's Torah. He's got him thinking now just a little bit. Okay, Paul, you're making me think. Now, if you didn't know Torah, you wouldn't understand this. Because, I mean, there's a lot of things within. If he's, if he's dealing with marriage here, why didn't he put in when he was dealing with, a woman was living with an unbeliever, and, she, and, he did, and she didn't, he didn't like it, she was free under the law to go marry, go marry a believer, that she wasn't bound by the Torah, uh, that was never considered adulterous, she was free to remarry? He didn't bring all that stuff in because he's not really teaching about marriage. He's teaching about what happened when man came in communion with the devil. And how that I've got to die to that so that I can marry another. And law means instruction. With the communion I had with Lucifer, there was instruction being given. There was a teaching on how to live being given. I've got to die to that. It said that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we are in the flesh, the motion of sin, which is by the law, did worketh in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead therein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Now, you know what that did right there, that one statement? He patted this, the graduates of the school of law on the head. You get it, it's the spirit of the law, it's not just the letter. The letter of the law killeth, the spirit of the law bringeth life. And the, the, the model for the school of Hillel was the spirit of the law. The, model, the, the motto of the school of, of Shammai was the letter of the law. And so he bopped one on the head 
And he said, listen, guys, I'm of the school of the Hillel. I know what's going on here. You just hold on. And so that kind of gave the rabbis from the school of Hillel, okay, now we can hold on just a little bit here with the Apostle Paul. He has not lost his marbles. What, what are you trying to convey here? Look what he says in 7. For what shall we say then? Is the law or is the Torah of God sin? What did he say? God forbid. God forbid. It's not sin. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for that I had not known lust except the law said, Thou shalt not coven. But listen, it's, it's crucial here in verse 8. By sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, which means lust. It, uh, it can not only be fleshful lust, I think I got that said right. It's one of those long $5 English words. It's easier to say in Greek or Hebrew sometimes. But it, it also can mean, if you re narcissism, self-centeredness. Everything's about me, everything's about me, everything, whatever it needs to please me and to make me happy. And to, that's what sin really generates, isn't it? He said, it worked to me all that, that sin took the commandment of God and it did something with it. It made it bad. No one's ever seen a religious spirit do that, have they? Oh, <laughs> well, let's not get into that. Now, in, in verse 9, he says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. How many know that as, as far as by the time he was able to speak and understand language, Paul knew the law? He was raised in a traditional Jewish home. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the difference of the age of learning. Or we call it sometimes in Christian theology, we call it the age of innocence. In a Jewish home, it was the age of learning. From the time that you could understand language until your bar mitzvah, 13, you were at the age of learning. They poured the word of God into you. They taught you what was right and wrong. They taught you everything that they could teach you. And what's interesting is when you begin hitting puberty, changes begin to occur in your brain. Did you know, and, and to show you how much you learn, by the time you're five years old, you've already learned 90% of everything you're going to learn in life. By the time you're five. Why? Because you had, you had a blank hard drive when you showed up. All you knew how to do was to eat and poop. Cry. That's a little, that's a little rude, but that's just the way it is. Everything else you had to learn. You had to learn. You had to learn language. You had to learn facial expressions. You had to learn how to move your arms, move your legs. You had to learn how to walk and talk. You, all these different things you had to do. And, and by the age of five, learning begins to slow down. It, it's like the, the brain is just an explosion of learning and creating new dentites. You know what are those? If you actually look at them as you begin to form new memories, they actually look like trees. It's really cool. And when you forget a memory, so there's actually chemicals in your brain can go trim off parts of the branches. Really interesting. So even in your own brain, if you're studying the word, you can actually grow a tree alive. Really, really some neat stuff. Uh, now you know why God referred to the knowledge of good and evil as a tree. Because in the mind, the, the very neuro, neurons and different things that create memory are literally trees in your mind. So you can have a tree of life, or you can have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil going on in your brain. But he said, listen, he said, during this age of innocence, I didn't know sin. But then there, 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 there are chemical reactions that go on. A, 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 a child before puberty, before the age of accountability, cannot think four-dimensionally. That's why it's very helpful for a child to say, if I'm getting ready to run out in the road, there's pain on my blessed assurance, and that's all I can think about is mama said no. That's as far as the discussion can go. You cannot teach them consequences until they can think four-dimensionally. All they need to know is mama will inflict pain if I do that which is wrong, or daddy will inflict pain, and I know that's bad. And you, you, cannot, you, you cannot explain 10, you know, you can't explain 15 steps. Now you do this and it's going to do this and it's going to do this and it's going to do this. And you're, we're trying to do that with kids and they can't do it. They're trying to outlaw inflicting a little bit of pain, not even knowing that that's how a child is wired to understand. 
that you cannot rationalize with them. You cannot logically take them down the steps. But as you get into the age of accountability, there, there is a brainwash that goes across your brain as you begin entering puberty and all your hormones begin to change, and it begins to shut down the learning. You begin to stem how fast you can learn. But all of a sudden, something else creeps in. Four-dimensional thinking, cause and effect. If I do this, it will cause this, and this could be wrong. Critical thinking. Critical thinking is impossible before the age of accountability. I mean, no God knew what he was doing. And the Apostle Paul said, when, when, when I got to the place of the age of accountability, or the age of responsibility within the Jewish community, something happened. I was now responsible before God. And the commandments happened, and I violated them, and I died spiritually. That's also why children before the age of accountability, if they're raised in a, in a home where the Spirit of God is able to flow, they're prophetic, they can hear from God. They'll have prophetic words. They'll know what's going on. Kind of freak you out if you've never been around it, you know, little T-Rail. Devil's getting ready to show up. Where? Have <laughs> you been watching a cartoon? They know what's going on. They'll, they'll see angels. Mary and I have both seen little babies in, in little pumpkin seats that you could tell by the expression of their face, and they weren't looking at you. They were looking at the angels around in the church. They, they can see into the spirit realm. But something happens along the way that all of a sudden, your mind begins to change, and now you're responsible. And so when the commandments revived, age of accountability, I violated them, and I died. Look what he says here going on. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be death. And the rabbi is saying, yeah, that, that's kind of true. I know what you're talking about. That's why, that's why there were sacrifices, because even though I knew it, I still stumbled. I still made wrong decisions. And then he, he, what, then he begins to, he said, now listen, is the Torah sin? No, no, no. And look what he says in verse 12. You need to underline this one in your Bible. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So he's standing up for the law of God, isn't he? What then? Was then that which is made good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might pierce sin, worketh death in me. By that which is good, that sin by the commandment by, might be exceedingly sinful. Now let me add something in right here. You'll see this throughout the Old Testament. Mary and I were talking about this the other day in, in, in Nehemiah. After they came back and they rebuilt the wall and they got, for three hours they stood and heard the Torah and the response of the people was they wept and they cried and they repented before God. Before you enter into salvation, the Torah is that pedagogy that leads you to repentance. It leads you to Messiah. It tells you what sin is so that you can repent. And one of the problems that we have today in churches, if the Torah is not taught, can there be repentance? Because one of the quandaries to me is I have seen people have emotional responses to the story of the cross. They come down, and I mean, I mean it, it is not flying everywhere, and they're crying, and they're gasping for air, and then next week they're right back in the same sin again. Or they start coming, the only, the only change in life is they start coming to church, but they never change. What happens? There was an emotional response to the cross, but none of them can tell you why the cross. Only when you understand Torah can you understand the depths of sin and how the Apostle Paul said it is exceedingly sinful and if you realize it is exceedingly sinful, then you can repent. That's what God intended for it. But at the same time, there was something else working here that was messing up the process that could only be fixed by the cross. Look what he says here in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Well, you, don't, you want to be delivered from something that is spiritual? You want to be dead to something that is spiritual? That's almost, that's almost contradicting what he said, that we were dead to the Torah, but we were alive to grace. Grace. 
And then he goes into this long thing that all of us can understand. For Verse 15, for that which I do, I would not. For that which I would, that I do not. But I would hate, uh, but that what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh uh, dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So I want to do it because I see God tells me to. I just don't have it in me to do it. That there's something missing here. For the good that I would do, uh, that I would, uh, for the good which I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that doeth it, but sin that dwelleth in me. How many know this is a theological argument? Only a rabbinical theologian can argue like this. But look, picking up verse 21. I find then a law, I find then a law, a law, a law, not the law. He's starting to open up something here that has been a conundrum for the rabbis ever since Moses. That the law would, there was something in man that messed up the law. And the law would bring death. And he was dealing with, with that conundrum in this to help them understand. I then find a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of the Lord after the inward man. With, with my mind, I, I, I delight with God after that. Now, why would a man who said he'd just been delivered from the law delight in it? If he's dead to the law, why is he delighting? He's already said, listen, it's good, it's holy, but there, there's some other things going on. He's trying to get us to think. Verse 23, he springs it on them. But I see another law. Here's where they poison the water hole. I see another law. And this guy has got to get you to question where certain aspects of the law that he was bringing up prior to his conversation, was he referring directly to the law of God or this other law? Because when, when he started talking about the law of God is a delight, the law of God is holy, he defined the law it was. But when he used the generic law, was he referring to the instruction that came from God or the instruction that came from Lucifer? Because of communion. You know, sometimes you got to think to be a Christian. And look what it does. I see another law in my member warring against the law of my mind. Why is it warring against the law of his mind? Because in his mind is where he had memorized the law of God. That out of my flesh is flowing another law that causes me to war against that which God has had me memorized and promised me prosperity and promised me. Have you, have you read Psalms chapter 1? Blessed is he who doesn't stand in their stuff, but he shall be like a tree of life. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And I try to do that and do what God tells me to do because he said that I'll be blessed and I'll be prosperous and it will be a tree of life to me. But at the same time, in me, another law is beginning to work that wars against against this one. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. He just introduced the other law. The law of sin. Now we're not talking regulations. Quit thinking like a Greek. We're talking instruction. You can go to sin university. All you have to do is be in good with the, the dean named Lucifer and he'll get you in and he'll teach you how to work sin to get all of its worth. Or you can walk with the God of the Bible and his law will first show you the absolute horror of the other law and its effects. And then it will show you what righteousness looks like and then tells you you can't do it. 
and then tells you that you need a redeemer. All the legal statutes that enabled Jesus to be the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world are coded into the Torah. You take them away, you take away the very law that enabled redemption. And that's what we've done with our Christian theology because we didn't understand the argument of what Paul was trying to bring together for everyone here. Then he goes on to say, O wretched man am I, who shall deliver me from this body of death in this flesh? All this stuff is warring on and I want to do good and I can't do it and I've learned the Torah like God told me to, but it, it, the sin in me gave reason for it. It became death to me and not life to me. That's why he had to add grace to it. You got to add the cross to it. But I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I, might, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So when you get into the flesh, what are you serving? The law of sin. But when you renew your mind to the word of God, the laws of God, you can serve God with your mind. And now he brings us to the crescendo. There is there now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Because when I was born again, I was given a new nature. I'm a new creature with a new feature. That Almighty God, the Holy Spirit has moved into me. Now I have a new dimension that will work with my mind that has been renewed to the Word, that they will work in concert with one another. Your, since the law of God is spiritual, your spirit man will thrive on the law. Doesn't that make sense? I'm not, I no longer walk. Now look what he says here in verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Once I get a Messiah, Messiah is the key that opens up the treasure chest of the Torah to where you can get what God really wants you to get out of it. And only Jesus, only Messiah, is the one that when I do it, though no longer does the law get corrupted by something to be death to me, it becomes life. Because in Messiah, the Torah of God is the Torah of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. God's word becomes life to me, becomes a tree of life to me. And now I'm functioning out of my spirit, man, my new man, that can work in harmony with my mind as I study the word of God. And it supersedes the law of the spirit of death. Just like when you're in an airplane, I shared this last week, and you enact the law of lift, use thermodynamics to enact the law of lift, it will supersede the law of gravity. And I thank God allowed that within our physics so that we can understand the moment that I stop walking by my spirit, the old man takes over. That's why you see believers going like this all the time. Because they've not been taught to walk in that new man. And they've also don't feed that new man because that new man feeds on that which is spiritual. And the law of God is spiritual. Our theologies have taken them away because we quote this one little snippet of him trying to create an argument to get them to have a discussion that he could bring them into the discussion to show them the new dimension of grace and that there were two laws working and they never knew it. Prior to the Apostle Paul, I guarantee you no rabbi understood the law of sin and death. This was revelation. He had to shake them to wake them. And then we pull this one step it out and we'll say, I'm not under the law. I'm not under the law. I'm not under the law. Yeah, and you're starving your spirit man to death. There's nothing for the, your new creation in you to work with. You're trying to get up here in the New Testament working with Windows. You don't even have the, your hard drive for it or DOS on it yet. How many times have we heard people say the New Testament really doesn't work? It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because you don't have its underpinning established. 
You're dancing around on the roof wondering why, how come the dandelions are higher than your roof because you don't have a foundation. You don't have a first floor. You don't have a second floor. You're dancing on the roof and wondering why you don't have a building. Now he goes on to say in verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. You have this dynamic going on through the flesh. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law. The what? The righteousness of the law. Did you know in Christ, the righteousness of the law can begin functioning in you? Now how can you have the righteousness of law if you're dead to it? These are things that make you go, hmm. It's right here, isn't it? The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if I'm following the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is enabling me to, as I, as I study God's word and I study God's commandments, I can now do them out of a pure heart and it flows unhindered and the Holy Spirit is here helping me to live the commandments of God. That I begin to get victory in my life. I remember years ago when uh, Dr. Carl Koch got to meet with Ariel Sharon over in Israel, and he, they're wanting to do a project over there. And Ariel Sharon, and he, he, I don't know if you know, but the, the Prime Minister of Israel is actually, when, when he's in that position, he, he is actually over all religious activity in Israel. It's not just a political, it's also a religious position. Now, I don't know if they've changed that now since they've established the Sanhedrin over there or not, but at that time it was. And so Ariel Sharon was standing there, not only as kind of the commander in chief over Israel, but as far as all the religious service. And he, he said, I don't, he said, you're a Christian. Why, 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 do you, why are you so interested in the Torah? And Carl looked him in the eyes and says, you don't understand. A Jew is living on the inside of me. Jesus came and, and moved on the inside of him, and he wants to do his Torah. <laughs> That's what this is talking about. As the life of Jesus begins to flow through me, I can live just like Jesus, and the righteousness of the Torah begins to flow in me as long as I stay in my new man and don't revert back to default in my old man. Verse 5, For they that do after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are of the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For the carnally minded is what? Death. But the spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither that it can be. So he's, that, oh, your old fleshly nature hates the law. It hates the Torah of God. It won't be subjected to it. That's why you're taught not to wrangle it. You've got to crucify it because your spirit man wants to function in the law of God. Let's go on. How many know we're, we're quickly approaching verse 11 here, aren't we? So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man not have not the spirit of God, he is none of his. Could I purport to you that somebody who says they're a believer and don't want to do the word aren't his? Isn't that what the Apostle Paul is saying here? They might have had an experience because they found out Jesus died and what a horrible death it was, but they can't tell you why, and they didn't see the ugliness of sin that he bore on himself and that it was their sin that he was bearing, and therefore they could never really repent. They just got emotional and joined a club. But when you can see out of the Torah the devastation of sin and what it does and how that it's your very nature and that you needed a redeemer and Almighty God said nobody can fix it but me and so he came down and took your sin and your sin and your death and all the things that go along with that on the cross and nailed it to the cross and he said if you believe in me I, I will die in your stead so that you can receive my life. Without the preaching of sin that can't happen. I was thinking this week, you know, the, the greatest revival that North America has ever seen started in the church of Jonathan Edwards. 
Now maybe he could have told everybody how to get blessed in Jesus. It's all okay, it's all grace, just come on in, you're destined to reign. Is that what caused the, and see that revival was crucial in American history. You don't know unless you've studied American history how crucial it was. Did you know at that time only people living together, only one out of five were really married? I mean, sin had gotten that bad in the colonies. It was so bad that those that began comprehending and working through all the things of having a republic, in their own writings they said, our greatest fear is we are not a moral of enough people to hold a republic together. It requires a high moral and religious people. If it hadn't been for Jonathan Edwards, America would not have had the moral background because it understood what sin was to reject it and begin walking in righteousness. The average American. Now, I'm not talking about all, you know, some of our founding fathers were believers. A lot of them weren't. They were deists and a lot of different things. But one thing they all had in common, they all reverenced Moses because they knew that the republic hinged on morals that were defined in the Torah. And you want to know why America is flying apart right now? It's because we lost our moral bearing. The sermon that Jonathan Edward preached that day would not be allowed on Christian television today. It would not be popular in the pulpits. It would have cleared the church. Because the name of that sermon was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now how's that for a warm fuzzy? When he got to preaching, there were literally men, and you had... They, they, we didn't have supports like this, but they, 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 they had pillars that come down in different places in the church to support the roof. You had men grabbing the pillars in the church, seeing the flames of hell, knowing that if they'd ever let go of that pillar, they would fall into hell. That's how real the Holy Ghost made that that day. And men begin to call on the name of Jesus and begin to get saved. And Jonathan Edward preached the commandments of God. This is God's standard. This is the way you live. This is right and this is wrong. And if you do that which is wrong, you don't belong to God. And became the very foundation of our nation. You know what that means? If he hadn't have done that, Masons couldn't have got anything done in the founding of America because it flew apart the first day it was done. They had to come along top of something that God did to make anything work. And then they walk around saying, yeah, it was by our wisdom. It was by our secret esoteric knowledge. No, it wasn't. It was by God saying, this is sin. You can't do it. This is righteousness. Start doing it. You better do it in Jesus. Why do we have a nation? Where was I? Verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but of the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so that's the argument here that we get into verse 11. That, that, that's the precipitating factor. Okay, I got the flesh working in me that's keeping me from God, but now I've been saved, and I got the spirit working in me, but I, I, I want to make this thing right. How, how do I do this miracle? But if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, what's going to happen? He's going to quicken your flesh to start making it do the word. Now let me tell you something. A Christian actually doing righteousness in this day and this age is a greater miracle than somebody coming up out of a wheelchair. This is what he's talking about here. The Spirit of God, the, the same power that rose Jesus victorious over death, hell, and the grave now dwells in you, and he will make you victorious over sin and the sin nature if you'll yield to him and you'll embrace Messiah and renew your mind to the Word of God and the commandments of God. Now you can finally do it, and it's not going to be death to you. It's going to be life. The only way that... now the, the God promises us that his Torah would be like, as a tree of life. We see that over and over and over again in, in the Old Testament. It's, like, it's a tree of life to those. It's a tree of life to those. And the rabbis are saying, not always. I don't always get the tree of life. I get strange fruit. 
That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Messiah came, and he's the key that when you open this now, the fruit that you're going to get is from the tree of life. It's only by the cross does the tree of life begin to take root in your heart. And it's by that same spirit that when nobody on this planet, you know, we always talk about getting enough people to believe. If we get enough people to have faith, things can happen, you know. We even talk about how Jesus, when he was in Nazareth, because their unbelief couldn't, I mean, he, the, in the Greek, it actually says this, a few you know, people with sniffly noses, he got healed. You know, there, there were no crutches thrown away. There were no real chairs discarded that day because they wouldn't believe. And so we think we've got to get everybody to believe. On the day that Jesus resurrected, nobody believed on the planet. There was nobody. Peter wasn't standing outside in front of that tomb saying, just any minute now, it's coming. Hold on there, Martha. We're going to see. You're going to see something special. None of them that were there doing that. They, when they went and they found the tomb empty, the women went to finish the, embody, the, the embalming process because they didn't, couldn't do it because they had a double Sabbath that week because of Passover. They didn't believe. The apostles didn't believe. Nobody on the planet was standing with God believing. And yet God was in agreement with himself. That's the event the Apostle Paul refers to here. The Spirit of God came into Jesus when he was in Sheol. And he opened up a can of whoop devil on Lucifer, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. You see, that war only lasted a minute. We think he was down there struggling with the devil for three days. No, no. It was a three-second fight, stood there long enough to get the keys, and then went over and spent three days in the bosom of Abraham preaching the gospel to them. And then when it came time, the Holy Ghost got on him, and he was down there, and he, he got a Holy Ghost fit down there preaching to them, and he said, boys, this can't hold us any long. Let's get out of here. And when he resurrected, the Bible said that other graves were open, and they all resurrected with him. Nobody up there believing. But all it took was the Holy Ghost. And now, you think your flesh is a problem? The Apostle Paul said, you don't need to get your brothers to agree with you. You just need to agree with God. Because that same spirit and that same power and that same anointing is now on the inside of you. And he will help you crucify the flesh. And he will help you make the word come alive. And now that Torah of God is a tree of life as long as you're walking by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's why the devil's greatest weapon in your life is getting you in the flesh. Because you're like an airplane cruising at 35,000 feet, and the minute you step into the flesh, you stall your engines, and gravity begins to take back hold. The Apostle Paul called it this way. He called it shipwreck because he didn't have the, uh, he couldn't imagine anybody flying in, in, through the air. But he said they shipwrecked. They got in the flesh and stayed there because they wouldn't repent. And they shipwrecked their lives. And how many believers we've seen that have gotten in the flesh that now we have denominations that are based upon fleshliness. And they're all a train wreck looking for some place to happen. But if you'd walk in the Spirit, the Spirit of God is in agreement with the Word. He's in agreement in the Word when it starts in Genesis 1. And guys, he's in agreement with the Word when you get all the way back to the last word where it says the end in the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit is in agreement with. And the law of God is in effect until the very last chapter in the book of Revelation. It is in effect. The great, right, the great white throne judgment can happen because the Torah is still functioning. When all is fulfilled, and Chuck and I were talking about this, this the other day, this universe not just this planet, this universe will cease to exist. Anything that has ever been touched by sin will cease to exist. God is going to create a new heaven, a new universe, and a new earth that's going to be probably about a thousand times larger than planet earth right now because if you figure just how big the new Jerusalem is, 
if we put it on our planet now, once you get about a mile up, there's no atmosphere, and the thing is, what, 100 miles, 120 miles tall? I mean, you have to have air. You have to have air. And so the planet is going to be huge, and all the redeemed that have ever walked with God are going to live in that place. And its physics are going to be different. There's going to be no sun, but there's light. And no matter what side of an object you looked on, you can't even find a shadow because the devil says, God says, no shadow, no devils, no nothing like that allowed here. It's all just light everywhere you go. In your refrigerator, you don't have to have a light on inside because it's light all by itself. If you made a box and sealed it up, it'd still be light on the inside because God's permeating light and nature yeah. embeds into everything. To get someplace, all you got to do is think. You're there. Going to put the airlines out of business in the new heaven, new earth. <laughs> and how many know then you're not going to need a Torah? Because everyone's going to be doing righteousness. There's no devil. There's no ha adversary. There's no the hasatan, the adversary. There's no sin. It's impossible to do sin. And you're living in a universe that sin never existed. Now that's what I call wiping away every tear. Yeah. But until then, we've got to ask ourselves, which law are we living under? It's not an option of law or grace. It's an option of the law of the spirit in Christ Jesus of life or the spirit of sin and death. You're either functioning under one or the other believer. And it's time for us to take a fresh look at all the books that start before Matthew and get back and reformat our hard drives, if you will, because you cannot, you, the Holy Spirit will not walk with you if you're violating and doing what he called sin. He's waiting for us to invite him. That's right. Help me do the right thing, Holy yeah. Spirit. Help me do the right thing. Let this new nature begin to flow in me. Let, this, let, let, let the nature of Jesus begin to flow in me and, and help me take this old stuff and nail it to the cross and to keep it dead. I, I don't want no zombies running around in my life. I want, I want that thing nailed there and stayed there. The Holy Spirit will say, man, I've been waiting years for you to ask me this. You've been sitting there just talking in tongues all these years when the, guy, when the Holy Spirit says, I wish you'd just stop the tongue and start the heart. Because you know what? You've been praying in tongues your whole life. Lord, lead me to the Torah. Lord, lead me to this new life. Lord, Lord, help me get, Lord, help me quit listening to the theology that I've been listening to all these years and help me function to what I really, that's what you're really praying in the spirit if God would give you the interpretation. Because the Holy Spirit trying to get you to cry out. Eh, maybe if I just get him to pray enough, he'll get a clue. That's why sometimes, this will answer question, sometimes when you pray in the spirit long enough, you find yourself doing things you normally wouldn't do. At least some of it finally started kicking in. Now, how many look at Romans a lot different this morning? It took a little bit of explaining to do, but guys, the whole book is one argument. And you've got to read the whole argument in context. You can't take one verse out of here in the middle of an argument where he was trying to use shock and awe to get to another point and then say, that's the truth. You've got to take the whole thing within context. And even maybe take a minute to understand Jewish hermeneutics, which is different than Gentile hermeneutics. They use block logic. We, we got to have, you got to start at the beginning and you got to go all the way in. Uh, that, that's why they call them wandering Jews, because they'll, they'll, they'll take it and they'll weave it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And you, you got to follow this, you got to follow it to understand it. Whereas a Gentile wants to go point A, point B. Boom, ba boom, ba boom. He wasn't a Greek philosopher. <laughs> Had a completely different way of thinking. And we've got to enter into that to see what the Apostle Paul was giving us. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Father, I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish where unto you have sent it. And Father, I thank you that because of Jesus this morning that we are free to walk in the Torah of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, Father, in a greater way than we have ever experienced before, cause your Torah to become alive with us, alive in our hearts and in our minds, that we can begin working in concert with the very spirit that caused Moses to write those words.
that caused the apostles to write those words, that caused the prophets to write those words. That we can function in your kingdom that we'll no longer grieve the Holy Spirit, but we'll allow the Holy Spirit to rejoice in us as his life flows through us. And we thank you and we praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.